Let us pray. For as much as, as without thee, O Lord, we could never do or say anything that would be well-pleasing in your sight, please now, as we study your word, direct and rule all our hearts and renew all our minds. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Tonight I'd like us to begin by looking at our first reading from the book of Nehemiah. A little background for you here. Nehemiah and Ezra are kind of a tandem in the Old Testament narrative. And it's situated at a time when the children of Israel have come back from their bondage, slavery in Egypt after more than 50 years having been taken into captivity in 587 BC by Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian king. An entire generation of Jews had lived in a foreign land in Babylon and died. What came back was a new generation that came back to ancient Israel, Palestine, and began rebuilding their Jewish life, rebuilding the temple, which began under Nehemiah. Ezra the priest is such a significant figure, it's, it's hard to give it proper due here. But when the ancient people went into exile, like we often do when we go into pagan culture, they became more assimilated to the pagan culture than they did clinging to their own faith. So much so, when they came back out of exile, they had literally lost the word of God. It been lost to them. By providence, I suspect, they literally dug it up. And here we have this scene with the great priest Ezra is reading from the book of the law. What's the book of the law? The Pentateuch. The, Pentateuch, the first five books of what we now know as the Old Testament, which would have been the extent of their Old Testament canon. Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, Leviticus, Deuteronomy. And you can almost see this, can't you? It almost looks like a Wesleyan tent revival going on. Ezra is elevated and he's reading from the law. And it's just like the blind's eyes have been opened. It's something they haven't even heard. They might have heard about it before their grandparents or parents died. It used to be the law. It used to be the word of God. We used to listen to it. And so you really get a sense of this amazing thing that's going on when people are converted, if you will, for the first time. Amen, amen, lifting up their hands. They bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. That's what people do whose hearts have been changed from darkness to light, from death to life, from falsity to the truth. I love the last line in today's <coughs> reading, the 10th verse, as we're again speaking to the people proclaimed, people, excuse me, gathered there, and do not be grieved in life, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. This day they went from not knowing the word of the Lord to having heard the word of the Lord, getting excited about the word of the Lord, and being told by their religious leader, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Not your personal strength, not your social standing, not your bloodline, not what might be in the future. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Amen? Amen. Amen. As it was then, so shall it still be, or should be, with us. The joy of the Lord is our strength. But I would argue we really live in almost an identical time, at least sociologically, to the time of Nehemiah. 
America and the Christian church in America, at least a huge swath of it, I would argue, a, major, a majority of it, long ago lost the word of God, lost their belief in the word of God. Not that you can't find the word of God. By the Bible anywhere. But in its heart, in its soul, in its essence, even those who claim to be Christian have compromised away the word of, the God, word of God, just like the ancient Jews did with the Babylonians and started embracing their gods. Not making Jesus the way, the light, the truth. Gosh, that would be offensive to a bunch of people in our culture today, right? But it's okay to say Jesus is a way, a light, a truth. Jesus might be my way, but he doesn't have to be your dog way. He doesn't have to be your way, dog. But in and of itself is a stupid statement, idiotic, foolish, philosophically impossible. Jesus can't be a way, a light, and a truth. He only can be the way, the light, and the truth, or he's a lunatic, a liar, and a fraud. That's it. Jesus is either God's only begotten son, or he's not. But he's not something else. He's not just a good teacher. He's not a great guy. He's the incarnate Son of God. God of God, light of light, the Word made flesh before time and forever. Okay. The joy of the Lord is our strength. This past Tuesday was the feast of the confession of St. Peter. It's bookended every year, seven days apart. 18th of January, the 25th of January, this Tuesday would be the conversion of St. Paul, his famous conversion on the road to Damascus. And it's the confession of St. Peter that's been on my mind all week, dovetailed to this incredible scene, like a Polaroid. I can see it was going on with Ezra in the book of Nehemiah. You know, brethren, Ultimately, there's only one question that matters in life. One. One single question. Not like, hey, what party did you vote for? Where did you grow up? What's your ethnic heritage? Are you all Irish? <laughs> Those questions don't mean squat. As we read, just two weeks ago, or was it last week I preached? Two weeks ago, I guess. God shows no partiality. But all those who call upon the name of the Lord shall be what? Saved. Saved. God doesn't have erroneous criteria like we do. And the criteria doesn't really change. It just matters who's in power. The color of your skin doesn't matter. It just matters who's in power. It's the same oppression. It's the same falsity. This nonsense that people of one strain are going to be less fallen than the next is ridiculous. It's to miss the whole point of the gospel. We all are falling. and Without Christ, we're lost. We're in the dark. In chapter 16 of Matthew's gospel, we read about the confession of Peter. The evangelist says, now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, so this is the 12, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Like Jesus doesn't know the answer to this question. And they said, so this is supposedly them speaking kind of in the plurality, I suppose people were just yelling out answers. Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? That's the most important question ever asked. It's the most important question you will ever answer. And you'll either answer in this life, or you will answer it at judgment day. But who do you say that I am? And of course, who speaks up? Simon Peter. 
You are the Christ, Messiah. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. A plus, right answer. And Jesus says to him, Blessed are you, Simon Bar Jonah, Simon, son of Jonah. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, changes his name. You are Cephas in Aramaic. And on this rock, that's what Cephas means, on this rock, I will build a church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The gates of hell can't prevail against that church's proclamation, which is this. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Against that, the powers of hell cannot prevail. And the true church only proclaims that truth. Any groups proclaiming something different, they are not the church. It doesn't matter what their sign says. It doesn't matter what their clergy babble about. It doesn't matter what they brag about. They are not the church. Because the church can only be what Christ came to earth to establish for her to be. Who do you say Jesus is? On January 23rd, 2022, who do you say who he is? Who do you say he is in the comfort of your own private, quiet darkness? Is that different than what you say he is in the public square? Is it different than what you would say he is when you're feeling the pressure from the world who don't want to hear who Jesus really is? Does he get compromised like you've moved to Babylon for the weekend? Or does the answer always stay true? Who is Jesus? He's the Christ. He's the Son of a living God. Mark Galloway, you are one of the biggest bigots I've ever met. Thank you. I already <laughs> knew that. Is there really a second piece, biblically, in the New Testament to the confession of St. Peter? And we find it in John's Gospel, the sixth chapter. It's in the famous Bread of Life discourse. Jesus, in one of his most famous sayings, certainly sermons, he's saying this to this big bandwagon that gathering of people that have been following Christ around for a while. After all, he's been healing people, making the blind see, the lame walk, and people want to get a piece of that stuff. Until he starts saying hard things. And then the big band starts bailing. It starts winding down. It gets smaller and smaller. And in the end of chapter 6, Jesus puts the capstone on it to see who's really going to hang in there about his true identity. He says, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. That's not too bold. <laughs> if anyone eats of this bread, they will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. What? Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. You can just imagine when John's Gospel is being read in the early 90s, some 60 years after Jesus' resurrection, when the Christian church is separating out from the synagogue, and the church is proclaiming this about the Holy Eucharist. Imagine the tensions going on in that first century. 
John tells us in verse 60 of chapter 6, when many of his disciples heard this, this saying, the bread of life discourse, they said, this is a hard saying. You think so? <laughs> Who can listen to it? But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, I've never heard any grumbling in my life in the church, said to them, so do you take offense at this? It's a bit of an open-ended question. And then the evangelist tells us, after this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. They didn't like what they heard. They liked all the trinkets. They liked it when they got what they wanted. Even healing, right? Healing. Who doesn't want healing? Everybody wants healing. Like, give me a Parkinson's pill right now, I'll take it, right? I'll be healed. But you know what? So what? So what if I'm healing Parkinson's just like that today? Does that make me immortal? Am I going to live forever because I'm healed of Parkinson's? No. Or I'm healed of cancer? Or dandruff? <laughs> You're seeking the wrong healing. We need healing of our soul. We need internal, eternal healing. Against such healing, the gates of hell cannot prevail. The vast majority of people want the wrong stuff. And when they go before the Lord, that's what they want. And when the Lord doesn't fix them the way they want, they go to Babylon. And they dance with other gods. So it is in America today. After this, many of his disciples, dozens, dozens and dozens, there was at least a circle of 72 we know about, turned back and no longer would walk with Jesus. It's kind of like being dropped by the woke today. They're not going to walk with you. Your answer about who Jesus is is wrong. So Jesus said to the twelve, just think about that. He's looking at them. Do you want to go away as well? There's the other question. Who do you say that I am? And in our culture today, do you too want to go away? Away from having the responsibility of having to act, behave, and speak like a true follower of the Messiah. Two questions. Who do you say that I am? Do you too want to go away? Verse 68. And Simon Peter answered the Lord, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we have believed and come to know that you are the Holy One of God. The second time Peter confesses the whole truth. Brethren, brothers and sisters, isn't that how it is? We can't be afraid to answer that question. Who do you say that Jesus is? He's the Christ, the Son of the living God. And when those who disagree with us don't like the answer, ask him the question, to whom shall you go? Where have you ever felt fulfillment, satisfaction, happiness, contentment in your life outside of God? Name one minute. It won't happen and it can happen. Father, to whom shall we go? Remember, the price of lukewarmness isn't good with Jesus. He will spit you out of his mouth on Judgment Day. It's 
two questions that matter in life. Where did you go to school, Mark Allen? Oh, I went to URI, I went to Rick, I went to Providence College, I went to Yale, but who cares? Who are you related to? Oh, I'm related to everybody on the Mayflower. <laughs> <laughs> who cares? How much money do you make? Not much. <laughs> <laughs> who cares? My wife. No, I'm <laughs> Who do you say that Jesus is? How will you honestly answer that question in your heart tonight, in your mind? How are you going to answer it tomorrow? How are you going to live it out? And when the heat gets turned up on you, and it will this week, and next week, and every day of your life, that question of Jesus will continue to echo. Do you too want to go away? I pray that your answer and my answer are Peter's answers. To whom shall we go? Oh Lord, you have the words of eternal life. And we have believed, and we've come to know that you alone are the Holy One of God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.